for having me. Look forward to discussing this with you and sharing with you some of my experiences with the U.S. China Green Energy Council. So just a little background on the council. Uh, it's a 5.13C nonprofit organization and uh, its mission is to promote collaboration between U.S. and China. And uh, you may remember uh, Henry Kissinger wrote an article for the New York Times and uh, arguing that you know some of these politicians are scared of China and worried about competing and trying to just uh, fight with them. And he said, yeah, we make we do a lot better if we just figure out ways to cooperate, work together, get to know each other better, and we all come out ahead. So this is what we do. So we try to find ways to bridge. Uh, the cultures and, and uh, help businesses to, to make profits working together. And there have been a number of successful businesses, uh, American and Chinese, that have worked together over the years. And they don't get as much publicity, uh, partly because when they're successful, they don't like to brag about it. Right? They just like to keep on succeeding. But um, of course, there are challenges, and there's the cultural differences and language differences that we work with. And, so um, our management team are people who have worked in China over over many, many years. It's working. Good, good job, Nick. Thanks. Uh, I myself, have, uh, I used to be a, a translator for the U.S. Air Force and uh, Security Service, and I used to actually spy on the Chinese back in, <laughs> in the 60s. <laughs> right? and, and one of the things I found out was that our paranoia about the Chinese invading us uh, are likely to invade us was uh, misplaced. I listened to the pilots, and as soon as they got near water, they said, I'm not going there. <laughs> and they were flying Soviet airplanes, which wouldn't have made it anyway. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, uh, people in uh, the intelligence services are paid to be paranoid, and that's what, what they do, is they justify their job by being afraid. And, uh, there's a place for that, but we also need to look at the whole picture. So, um, so we have the flexibility of being a non-governmental organization. We have people who have lived and worked in China for many, many years, <coughs> decades, and we have uh, relationships between Chinese companies, Chinese government officials, American government officials, uh, and uh, nonprofits. Although China nonprofit is not. Uh, technically a legal organization in China. Um, but there are some that, that do uh, kind of walk that edge. All right, so we have several task forces in the Green Energy Council. The Smart Grid Task Force, the Green Building and Eco City Task Force, which is mine, uh, Green Transportation, Renewable Energy, Green <coughs> IT, and Green Investment. and. Uh, no, our perspective when we founded the organization was that, you know, uh, one of the biggest problems that we have today is that people are in silos and that we need to start thinking more holistically. And so we founded the organization with all these different task forces to try to bridge those silos because if you don't have investments, you can't do business, right? If you don't have uh, uh, renewable energy, well, we're about green energy and energy efficiency. So. But buildings and cities need green energy, they need good IT, they need investors, all of those things. So we need to work together. But one of the things that we found is that the uh, human condition, uh, something that uh, I think, uh, what's his name? Um, I forgot his name now. Anyway, there's a theologian that wrote about the history of Christianity. They said, well, it was founded to teach people to love one another, and they've been... <laughs> Uh, once they get organized, <laughs> they're more concerned about their power and, and making sure that people uh, follow their orders than about promoting love and, and neighborliness. Well, that's the paradox of organization is exemplified even in you know, religious organizations, which is that we need to be organized to get things done. And we need people to be able to follow you know, patterns and be, be predictable. But as soon as we do that, we can get over-focused on that, and then we forget the mission. And t today we hear a lot about from companies about, well, you know, it's about the customer, isn't it? 
and businesses are thinking about how to make money, they're about their shareholders, they forget about their customers. Okay. All right, so uh, I'm focusing on eco-cities, the green cities, and, and the thing about eco-cities is that they, there are many dimensions, and you need an organization to keep track of all these things, but you have to keep track of all these different things if you want to have a city that is uh, uh, ecologically functional, and we'll get into that in a minute. So you have to measure all these different things and keep track of them, and then you can, and if you don't measure it, you know, the Green Building Council, the U.S. Green Building Council, they set up the LEED standards, and they built all these buildings, and they didn't think to measure them until after they were built, and then after they were built, they found out that, well, in theory, they were supposed to save energy, but actually, they they, there's no real pattern. Some of them say wasted more energy than the old buildings. <coughs> so now, in LEED 3.0, they have to measure them to prove that they actually did do what they said. So these are some of the some of the problems. So my point is that it's it's complicated if you want to be holistic and sustainable. And sustainability is based on the principle it's called biomimicry. We learn from nature. The way nature works is that whatever stuff whatever one process does in nature, the waste from that is food for some other process. So the whole of nature works together. And if it doesn't, then things start going wrong. And human beings Learn from nature, but we don't learn to be holistic like nature. We do some things and we create problems for somebody else. So there are five different types of, uh, of uh, living things in the earth. So there's the bacteria, algae, fungi, plants, and animals, and we need all of them. Because right? they all take care of part of the process. Same thing for human beings. We need to, there's five different kinds of intelligence. There's academic or scientific intelligence. But there's also emotional intelligence, uh, artistic intelligence, eco-literacy, and the capacity to implement, which is uh, knowing how to make things work. And so this is an old story, the story of the blind men and the elephant. It's like, well, every one of those blind men were right. But if they didn't compare notes and work together and figure out what the real elephant was, they, they, they got it wrong. So that's the nature of uh, cities, right? Cities are very complicated, and we need to look at all those dimensions. So how do we keep track of all that information? Uh, the Chinese have come up with a model, which they called um, the yin-yang model. Right? It's about it's about balance. It's not black and white. I mean, yin and yang are black and white, but they're, actually it's about balance. And if you try to do all black or all white, things will go wrong. So they have environmental protection, people, orient, people oriented, uh, organizational innovation, individual innovation, resources saving, energy conservation, collaboration and competition. All those things need to coexist in a balanced way. Now, when we get to uh, how we're going to keep track of all these things, we have to measure, we have to have uh, uh, ways to report that data. and, and so. We have uh, on the right hand side, we have smart grid, green IT, transportation, green buildings, renewable energy. All of those things uh, need to be measured, reported, and people who have to make decisions about them have to have the right information. And, 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 they, and they try to carry, these, carry out these principles of organization so that smart living, smart citizens, smart governments, smart mobility, smart economics. And what does that mean? It means if you look at the whole picture, you look in a balanced way. You got to balance all that, then you have to re measure it, report it, and get it back. To <coughs> so that's what the internet and the grid are about. And we haven't had those until now. Now we got them, and it's growing. So it started out with uh, just the internet not too long ago, and then it expanded into networked and connected. Uh, machines and people and equipment and all that. Then buildings, a lot of our buildings are, are work with people that do building information management systems. Our buildings tend to be not well integrated, right? They, they heat one part of the building, cool another part, and then the air gets moved around and they have to waste energy heating and cool. So we need to coordinate that information. But then they get out of things. So there are now getting to be so many things on the internet 
that they don't have enough addresses, so they had to expand the t uh, internet protocol to the IPv6, so they'll have more addresses for machines and equipment. On top of that, how do you get all that information back and forth? So the systems that we have, like Ethernet, <coughs> not fast enough. Right? Wi-Fi seems to be not fast enough. But part of it is the protocols and how it's managed. So bottom line, though, is we should not expect the machines to handle everything for us. Well, the machines can they Once you set a machine in motion and you set the parameters, uh, and it doesn't know about you know changing the weather or the change. There's a Jerry Young building in, in, at Stanford. They built it to uh, lead platinum. And they found out like it was wasting more energy than all the other buildings <laughs> <laughs> after they measured it. And why? Most of it was because the people who were using the building didn't know. They didn't know how to use the building. They were trying to, this building was set to change the temperature, turn on the heat, turn on the cooling, open the windows automatically. But the people didn't know that, so they kind of did what they do, and the building couldn't understand it. So uh, there's a concept called buildings that teach. The buildings, if they're automated and they can help us save energy and be more comfortable, it needs to teach us how to use them to get that result. Otherwise, we're going to override it. Okay, so... There now, we at the Green Energy Council are working with a company called uh, uh, this is from Bay Microsystems, the IBEX family of uh, routers. But basically, because information is getting so complicated and so hard, hard to move around on the internet and over the wires, they actually are moving to uh, the uh, synchronous optical networks. And then they've got a new system now for packaging the data. So they pull the packet, and inside that little packet, it can have its own system of encryption, its own system of keeping track of the kind of data it is. It could be voice, it could be movies, it could be uh, uh, temperature data, it could be electricity, all of that. They can be packaged, and then they can set as a whole package, and they can do it at like uh, 20 to 100 gigabits a second. So it's really fast. By just packaging it all together, send it that way. And it's synchronous. So it goes that way and this way at the same time. That's pretty complicated, but uh, they've got it worked out so that they can, they can make it work. And in fact, TCPIP you know, begins to do that kind of thing. When, it, when one wires, one channel is too crowded, it will send the information over here and over here. But it does better than our highway system. It actually does lets the information know where the open roads are and lets it go there. But this adds to that, makes it like quite a Oops, did I push the wrong one? Okay. <coughs> okay, so it's end-to-end -end lossless fabric. So it's a fabric network of systems and it actually can work over Ethernet, over copper wires on even broadband over power lines, uh, but it's fastest over optic. optic. Software defined, virtualization, local, regional, national, it can go international. And you know, remember uh, Huawei was uh, kicked out of a couple of jobs that they got into. One because they were close to a military base and, and people were worried they might be stealing information. <coughs> that means our government bureaucrats don't understand encryption. Encryption is software. <laughs> so if, if they're put in the hardware and the stuff is transmitted over the hardware, but if you got a good encryption, they still can't get it. And this stuff is really complicated for encryption. Okay, so we've been promoting uh, uh, relationships between the U.S. and China for the last several years. We have meetings every year. Uh, we have uh, companies that meet with each other and talk about the ways they can work together. And uh, we consult with them. We help them. Now, one of the one of the keys that people say about you know doing business in China is relationships, or what they call guanxi. Uh, China traditionally has been you know an authoritarian system since the Roman Empire days, and and uh, so what happens in, in in authoritarian systems? Well, I learned when I was in the military, right? 
the general gives an order, it might get carried out and it might not. If the general gives it to you, you do it. But if it comes down a chain of command, that's another story. So there have to be ways to make it work, and that, that's relationships. So the Chinese have the system of relationships. It's not just about who you know gets the deal done. It's about you've got to know people if you want to make things to work. And you've got to work with them because things change. And if things change and you've had a contract, but the contract doesn't work, if you're talking to each other, you can work it out. So that's a critical point for doing business with the Chinese. But anyway, anyway, really. Okay, these are some of the companies that we work with. Uh, we go to Washington every year. We meet with uh, <coughs> uh, Mike Honda takes us over and introduces us to different committees. And uh, we meet with the West Department of Commerce, Department of Energy, and so on. And uh, so they hop out. But things are really looking up, and the Chinese actually are getting very interested in investing in the U.S. too. So they've got a, a lot. I mean, they used to invest just in the big funds, but now they invest in the deals. They even have an incubator, two incubators in San Jose. Uh, okay, we published a couple of books, uh, and we're working on a book this year called uh, Vision 2020. So we're predicting uh, what will happen in 2020 and trying to figure out how to make uh, energy efficiency uh, sustainable economics. We want growth, but we don't want growth that will choke us to death. Okay. Now this year we usually have one conference in, in the Bay Area, one conference in China. In 2008 we were in Beijing, and next year we were in Suzhou and Shanghai. This year we actually we had conference in Ningbo, then we had one in Shanghai, I had one in Yangzhou, and then later uh, we went to Tianjin, which we went to actually back in 2008. But Tianjin, Tianjin is the second China-Singapore joint venture green city development. So the one in, in Suzhou was done in 1994 when the United Nations first started its uh, ISO 14000 series of sustainable development rules. That has made so much money. The raise of standard of living in Suzhou is unbelievable. And uh, now Tianjin is uh, another joint venture following that model. Times have changed, so they're doing it differently, but much bigger. And it's, so it's very promising. And we're, we're working on, remember the internet protocol system that I talked about, the ID system? That one, uh, we're working on putting that between Beijing and Tianjin so that the communication, data communication will be very fast, very efficient, both within the city and between those cities. And we're doing a smart uh, uh, training for city managers to teach them about smart grid. What's one of the interesting things, we had a training back in San Francisco last fall, and I trained some mayors, and they came and they started saying, well, you know, our, our traditional system buildings were much better than yours. And uh, in fact, as they were. Then we started talking about, okay, what are the principles, you know, well, it's, it's what's called feng shui. Feng shui is something, they say, oh no, that's superstition. But they don't even know their own uh, culture that well, right? Feng shui has become somewhat superstition, but it's based on science. So it's like, if you want, uh, if your building's in the north, you don't, put the front door towards the north, because it's cold. You don't put all the windows on the north side, right? There are a lot of things about feng shui that are actually just good science or good psychology about how you feel feel being in the building. So, uh, and transportation, of course, they have better transportation in the old days, but then nowadays they, they uh, copied us. But then they're faster. They got the high-speed rail. And they got six of them built. We still haven't got our first one done. <laughs> so, but anyway, we need to exchange information. We learn from them. They learn from us, and that's what the Green Energy Council is about. And uh, the whole idea of innovation is learning from each other. Thank you. Thank you.